Welcome to the Teacher Transition Podcast, where we celebrate the incredible things former teachers are doing now. I'm Allie Parrish, and I'm so glad you're here. So teacher friends, are you ready to hear what your amazing educator skills look like when they're put to work in the world beyond the classroom? Let's jump in. We have another exciting episode for you today, especially if you are really creative and there are passions and interests that you want to pursue that may not relate much with teaching. In today's episode, we are going to learn from Jill. And as you'll see, a recurring theme in a lot of our episodes is that life and our work life have different seasons. So in this episode, Jill and I are going to be talking about how different seasons of life, maybe becoming a mom and different family needs also lead us to making adjustments with our work life. So pay close attention to how her personal life and her work life correlate with how she does things differently at different stages. Also, check out the really creative passions that she pursues and how she integrates them with teaching in her communities. One important thing to note in this episode is that Jill shares how she started following this creative interest and passion of hers in a season of life when she had more bandwidth. And for her, it was when her child could go to school. Now, for some of you right now, having your kids go to school is not an option. Maybe they are homeschooling right now, or maybe you're looking after family members, or maybe you have different responsibilities on your plate presently. Well, still learn from her amazing example how when in your future, more time and opportunity opens up so that you can follow whatever your personal creative passions are leading you toward. I'm super excited for the delicious info that she is about to share with us and the personal path that she pursued. We have Jill Childry with us. Welcome to the show, Jill. Hi, Allie. Thanks for having me. We're so glad that you'd be on and share your story. Uh, Jill, let's take it back further, though. When you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? (laughs) I would say that I probably wanted to go dig up dinosaur bones. I wanted to be an archaeologist. I wanted to be out in the sand and the dirt and all the tools digging up the things. Did you teach dinosaurs when you were in the school? I don't think that okay. I did. No, it's not that yeah, sad. I was like, this would be a perfect fit yeah. with some of the elementary ed content. I know. Um, right. Tell us how you went into teaching. What did you teach? Where? How'd you get started? Sure. So um, my path to teaching was a little less direct than probably most people's were. I got a little lost in college and um, ended up quitting for a few years and went back um, on my own accord. And I kind of said, well, I've, I've already been in school this, this long, and what can I do where I can graduate the fastest? Um, and, you know, and do something that I think that I could enjoy, and teaching was it. So I, like I said, got a little bit late start than everybody else, but went into teaching, and um, I taught in South Georgia in a little town called Douglas, and at a little teeny tiny school, where I taught first I love grade. first grade. My mom taught first grade. Yeah. Yes. Oh, they're so precious and so sweet true. still. And what were some of the things that you loved about teaching? How long did you teach? Sure. I only taught for a couple of years because I started having children um, because I graduated so late. But I loved first grade because they were still so sweet. They were still kind of babies, but not in that you know, in that they were just not, they were still innocent and sweet and they just had a sweet disposition. And so many of them were eager to learn. And I felt like first grade was such an influential time. And let me ask you, Allie, do you remember your first grade teacher? I sure do. Sure do. Everybody remembers their first grade teacher, M- right? Mrs. Hall, she was great. Yes. We do. Yes. And so everybody loves their first grade teacher and everybody remembers their first grade teacher. And um, I went into teaching first grade that I was going to be that teacher that everybody loved and everybody remembered had a positive impact. And did you feel like that? Like, did you feel like you were able to thrive and you loved it and they loved you? 
unfortunately, I did not feel like I thrived as a teacher. I did very much like being in the classroom with the kids, and I very much felt entirely overwhelmed the entire time yeah, that I taught. Yeah, and especially those first couple of years can the be so years. overwhelming. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. yes. And during that time, I had an infant at home, and and I had a baby. And um, I don't know if you taught during like 08, 09, and, and 2010, but it was the economic recession. And it hit really hard in my area, so much so where teachers were being let go. And um, the teaching climate was... It, it was difficult. It was entirely challenging because the resources were so. You know, strange. I hear I hear a lot of teachers talking about teachers being let go, and where I taught in yeah. Utah, that hardly ever happened. But exactly. that's so interesting to hear. Yeah, yeah, yes. So teachers were being let go left and right. Allie, this will blow your mind. In my school system, they did not have the budget for substitute teachers. Wow. And if you, if you as a teacher, if you had to be absent for some, you know, catastrophic reason, your class got divided up into the other first grade classrooms. Yeah. Wow. So I've never heard I of that. know. I've never even imagined Yes. That. And so, you know, if I had 21 kids um, in my class and there were three other teachers, seven of my kids, if I had to be out, seven of my kids would go in um, into other teachers' classrooms for the day. And it was stressful. I mean, yeah. for, for all the parties involved. Yeah, that would definitely make yeah. you not want to take a sub day, even if you really needed <laughs> You couldn't. Though. Yeah, wow. you really couldn't. Um, it was very like frowned upon. So that was the climate that I was that I was teaching in in 2008 and nine and 2010. Very yeah. different. Interesting how the economy, you know, plays really plays a part in all of that. Yes. And very much so during that okay, time. So you had two little kids at home and clearly yes. some unique mm-hmm. scenarios surrounding and what's going on in the classroom. Tell us a little bit about right. yeah, your transition. Yeah. So I, like I said, I I taught in a little town in South Georgia, and this is actually where my husband grew up at. And I thought I would love to live in a little town in South Georgia. I thought I would kind of have like a little Mayberry feel maybe. Um, And it just turns out I'm not a small town girl. (laughs) And so I wanted to move back to the Atlanta area where I was from. um, And I joke, I wanted to move back to civilization. And and, um, and so when we uh, when we were able, when my husband got a, a job in the Atlanta area, that was my transition out of teaching. So, and like I said, in Georgia during that time, it, there was a teaching freeze. And so when we moved, I knew that that was it. Like I would not be going back into teaching because nobody was hiring. Mm-hmm. Yes. We, you know, we moved from a little town in South Georgia where, you know, I, I knew everybody and had connections in the school system to it, the Atlanta area where I knew, I knew no one. And so I felt like my, my odds of getting another teaching job were slim. And quite frankly, I was, I didn't want to go back. Into because the they weren't hiring. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Right. So I kind of used that as my app. Understood. Yeah. A lot of our audience understands. Yeah. And then did you work as a next step? Were you home full time? I um, worked from home after that. So I tutored a fourth grade homeschool student who was training for the Olympics. So that was wow. really interesting. Um, and it was just, a yeah, it was a part-time job for me. And um, she came to my house four days a week and I did her school with her. And then she went to the gym for the rest of her day. That's interesting. Okay. Yes. It is. Yes. So that lasted for um, a year. And then I had another, another child and just used that as an opportunity again, to just play mom for a little while and not to have um, any, any other, anything on my plate besides just raising my kids and being at home with them. Um, And during this time is actually when I started hobby baking. Very cool. Yes. Um, can I pause yes. this for one second? I, I, I'm so excited to go into this, but I want to pause this for one second because some of our audience 
are women who have little kids at home and they yeah. are choosing to be there full time and work is very right. alluring to them. And I know that that's really praised in some ways in our society presently, but can you just right. maybe speak or give a shout out to those that are choosing full time and, and we totally honor and praise those who are, are doing work with parenting at the same time, well. but I yeah. can tell some of our audience yes. is choosing full time parenting and yes. They're, right. they're, sometimes they're a little bit, they have feel a little bit of guilt or other things there. Can you just speak to them for one second about what it was like for you? Absolutely. You know, being able to just be mom was a dream come true for me. Um, it was all I really wanted. I really didn't want to always have to be um, having a side gig and having something else to do. And so those few years where I was just at home with my children, I really do kind of have a, a magical view of those days. And I know that they were hard days and long days and difficult days. Um, but I you know, when I taught Allie, I felt like every day I went into the classroom and I put 20 other children in front of my own children. And that was hard for me, for my, like a mental and, a, and emotional state. And so when I finally, for a few years, just got to be at home and please don't, I mean, and when I say just, I'm saying just in like the the biggest, most engrossing way. It was a wonderful experience and it's a hard job. It's not easy to be at home with your kids all day long at all, but it's magical. So yes. It's where the magic happens for sure. Great. And then let's, yeah, let's chat about the baking. I'm so excited to hear about this. Yeah. And then maybe somewhere a little bit further along in the conversation, you can speak to some of our audience who is full-time at home, but they're also wanting to do something else now right? and maybe feeling a little bit of guilt about, oh, but can I do both? But can you do both? So we'll get that audience in here as well. Okay. Sounds great. I did start hobby baking during this time. Um, like I said, the recession had hit hard in our area. My husband was a financial advisor, and this is probably the last thing that you wanted to be during the econo economic recession of 2010. And um, so I started hobby baking and I eventually led to getting um, some paid gigs here and there. And eventually I got asked to do these things called decorated cookies. And so I was really eager to learn um, about my craft and how to make it better. And I really did enjoy this part of it. And so um, I started a, a tiny little business and where it, where I made cakes and, and I opened an Etsy store. And from the Etsy store, I shipped cookies all over the United States. And um, again, Allie, we had to move. <laughs> and so... <laughs> Um, when you have a local business and you have a move on your horizon, you have to rethink things a little bit. And so, um, again, we took our family and we moved and from the Atlanta area. We moved an hour and a half north to, you know, a suburb of North Atlanta. And again, I, I was at a crossroads. Do I, what do I do? Do I continue? Do I start my business over? Do I start to build this thing from scratch again in this local community or do I choose something else? And I have always kind of felt pulled to, you know, use this degree that I have. And I transitioned into um, running a children's ministry program at a local church. And I felt like, yeah, I felt like it was a perfect fit. I was using my degree um, in childhood education. I was teaching um, once a week on a Sunday. I was, um, you know, planning curriculum. And um, I, you know, had this faith el element in there. And I was like, this is perfect. I love this. And yeah, until it, until it wasn't. And so during this time, Allie, my daughter and uh, my, my middle daughter was diagnosed with a disorder called selective mutism. And um, when I tell that to people, I get this totally blank look um, from people because they have no idea what that is. And they're almost kind of afraid to ask 
what is that? And uh, selective mutism is an anxiety-based disorder where um, the individual who has it basically freezes up in situations that most people don't get frozen up about. Um, so after I went to work in, a, you know, at this church, um, my daughter went into preschool, and at the end of the year, her teachers came and said, you know, she hasn't said anything all year long. We've never heard her speak. And my jaw dropped to the floor because I, she was the most chatty, verbal, you know, two-year-old um, that I had ever come across, especially after having my son first, who you know, had delayed, who had delayed speech. And so when she was stringing together complete sentences at 18 months old, I just thought, wow, you know, she was just a phenom to me. And so at, you know, the age of three years old to hear that she hadn't spoken a word in preschool all year long was alarming, right? And so I tell my husband and he's, you know, you know, it's no big deal. Just keep an eye on it. You really shouldn't worry about it. But my gut says, this isn't right. Uh, this, this is this really, there's something off here. And so I, of course, what does every mom do? They go to Google, right? <laughs> And so I go to Google and, and, and selective mutism pops up. And so I brush it aside because I'm like, oh, no, this doesn't sound good. And I don't really, I don't really want to know about this right now. So we ride the summer out and she starts her same preschool back the same year. And um, we're a few, a few months later at the same preschool, same school. And um, a month into school, I broached the teacher again. I'm like, has she spoken yet? in this school setting and the answer you know was was no and so i made an appointment at my pediatrician and took my daughter mary claire and she was immediately diagnosed with selective mutism which is unheard of um, most people have to jump through hoops to get this diagnosis they have to go to neurologists and speech pathologists and the fact that my pediatrician was able to diagnose it right there was such a gift that I really didn't even realize at the time. So the stress of dealing with her her new diagnosis and not having tons of resources out there to pull from locally, um, I was entirely stressed out all the time. The level of anxiety in our house had skyrocketed um, with just not knowing how to deal with, you know, with this, this diagnosis, with treatment, with care. And then on top of that, you know, my, my work that I was doing and I felt overwhelmed and like I was not doing a great job handling any aspect of my life. So thankfully, the Lord has a amazing way of directing me. And um, in January, when all of this was swirling around in my head, you know, what do I do? How do, do I, what do I continue in? How can I give Mary Claire the care that she needs? And, you know, I feel so pulled and I got pregnant surprise for the very last time. And to me, that was the sign that it was time for me to step away from, um, from the ministry position and focus back on my family and focus my energies back um, on meeting their needs and providing the care that everybody needed. So I stepped away totally again. So you can see I've ha I have these periods where I work and then I stay at home and then I work <laughs> and then I stay at home. And so um, I stepped away from my ministry position and focused solely on just getting through what was kind of a difficult pregnancy and figuring out the care that my daughter, Mary Claire, needed. And part of that care included me homeschooling her, which is a job all in its own. Again, Allie, what am I doing? What am I using? My teaching degree, everything for me keeps 
coming back to teaching. Um, you know, it, it's just the circle of things. But of course, I, I don't see this at the time, right? Yeah, it's easier when we look back. So true. When we, yes, exactly. When we look back. And so I see, gosh, you know, here I am, I'm teaching again. So um, I don't know about where you are, but where I am, there is a thriving homeschool community. And it's not the old school homeschool community. I think where, you know, that people thought of the, you know, the weird kids back in the 1990s that didn't know how to socialize, you know, and, and were lacking in, you know, some skills. And that is not the community that I'm a part of at all. It's something really big and fabulous and great. And it's really just about embracing choice and it's about embracing flexibility and honoring your kids needs and their own interests and so I was pulled into the homeschool community for those reasons so again here I am I'm just at home and when I say just I please don't take that the you know the wrong way I am at home doing all the mom things for my kids and I have an infant at this point in time as well over the years, I have found that I need something that, that belongs to me. I need to do something that is mine, that is apart from my kids. And so I found myself again, you know, two years ago going, okay, I need something to do. I want something to do. What did I love doing? And what can afford me the flexibility that I need to continue in this role of taking care of my of my children and my family a hundred percent and I came back to cottage baking which a, a cottage baker is someone who bakes from their home and so um, I said okay I will do this again but I'm gonna do it on my terms this time and I'm gonna make it something that I can that I can make, that I can really love and, you know, not feel the overwhelm, you know, just still be very present for my family. Great. So it allows you the flexibility that you want, as well as the interest kind of passion outlet. Exactly. Yes. And like a lot of teachers, it gave me that creative outlet too. And in fact, so um, I started, per, you know, producing cookies. That's what I did. I opened my Etsy store back up and, you know, within a week I started having orders rolling in again. But the thing about Etsy is after you make these, you know, you, this beautiful product, you have to bubble wrap it all up and stick it in a box and hope and pray that it gets to your destination in one piece. And so this element was really stressful and very time consuming after the fact because it was really time consuming, making sure everything was packaged just so. So I took a look at my business and I was like, ooh, I don't like this part. And so I said, okay, what do you want to do? What do you need to do? And, uh, you know, I need a local, a local business. And so I shut down the Etsy store and I said, all right, I've got a month. I'm going to give it everything I have and get in my local community and start pulling um, from my local community for business, which was actually kind of a scary thing because you go from being online and not being face to face with people to having a very personal connection with people within your community with that face to face interaction, you know, when they come to your house to, you know, pick up their cookies and when they're ordering from you. So about four months into um, tapping into my local community, I said, okay, what next? I think I want to start teaching other people how to do this. The DIY industry is huge, right? Everybody wants to learn how to do stuff. Right. And um, I, you know, was one who wanted to learn how to do this because honestly, I just wanted, in the very beginning, you know, eight years ago, I just wanted to make cute things to take to my kids, preschool functions. I just wanted to be the mom who showed up with the plate of adorable cookies and my kid would go, that's my mom. My mom made that. And that's, that's how it started. And I love hearing and, how it evolved. 
you know, it was in one community, right. then it went online and then it was in a different yeah. community community. Yeah. And so then you started going into, you were saying teaching others how to. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I'm, um, I'm really fortunate and where I live, I have a totally separate kitchen space in my finished basement. And so, um, I was like, man, I'm just going to see if anybody will show up and come to a cookie class here at my house. And Allie, you want to hear something hilarious? Yes. The first class I ever tried to do was a total failure. Nobody came. Um, I had two friends who said they would come. One of them flaked out. One of them said they would come. And then I had one person sign up for it. That's it. And um, I started and I said, okay, you know what? It didn't work out this month. I'm going to try it again. I'll try it again next month. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it again. And so, yeah. And so I tried it again, put it out there again. And um, second class took off. So, you know, and this is also like a great example of like your, for all your marketing people, you know, your hot traffic, your cold traffic, your warm traffic, and it goes in stages. And so um, it's no wonder, you know, that the first time people heard about it, they didn't go for it because that was cold traffic, right? And so I had to warm people up to this idea. But you started, you know. And so I started classes and they took off. Gosh, I mean, so unexpectedly. And six months after I started classes, um, I was probably teaching more classes than I was actually making cookie orders for people. And um, because, Allie, my goal in all of this is to keep this business at a manageable level. Awesome. It's to keep it to where I keep my pro- priorities in order and in line, which was putting my family's needs first. So I said no a lot. <laughs> so uh, I'm just now really in the last six months in a growth period. Um, so for the first probably 18 months of this business, it was like trying to keep a lid on a pot of boiling water. Every month it just wanted to bubble over and bubble over and bubble over and bubble over. And I had to keep it, you know, shut and go, this this isn't the time for this to be wildly huge right now. Because at that point in time, we were still trying to figure out the appropriate care for our daughter, Mary Claire, and carrying the stress of that. When you have a child with selective mutism, you act as that child's therapist. And so you are constantly in situations and, you know, just seeking those those engagements and playing therapist with your child in different environments and different social settings. And quite honestly, it's exhausting. I can only imagine. I'm sure that it is. Yes. Yes, it very much so is. And so that was my number one priority through through that time. About six months ago, we had a tremendous breakthrough with her. And um, it's part in it's, it's part because of the therapy that we finally saw it in we we actually go to a center in New York City every six months for her care and for her therapy and finding local treatment. Just we did it. We didn't get anywhere for you know five years with local treatment. We finally went to some experts in New York City. They have helped us tremendously. We go every six months. Last November, we finally had a breakthrough and we also found a what we call a hybrid school for her. And a hybrid school is a home school but also gives some students somewhat of kind of a a traditional school feel as well for a social setting. I love hearing about this. I've always been so curious if there was something like that. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, This is the only way that we homeschool is with the help of our hybrids. And, you know, each one of my kids' needs are different. And so the hybrids kind of help, kind of help fill those needs. And it also takes some of the pressure off of me, off of being their sole you know, their sole teacher and sole provider, and it gives them exposure to other teachers and other teaching styles and other expectations. And so it's, a, yeah, it's a great, it's a great um, compliment to homeschooling. So last November, my daughter, Mary Claire, went into a four day a week hybrid homeschool, and she started thriving. She is completely verbal in her school setting now. It's the first time since she was three years old that she's been verbal in a school setting. Congrats. Yes. And so, you know, having her 
make progress. And she's not like, she's not healed. I mean, totally. She still has selective mutism. There are still places where she cannot talk that are silent places for her. But to have this big, this big thing, you know, this, this big win for her took a huge load off of my emotional, you know, my emotional capacity to take on more in my business at that point in time. And I love um, using my business to raise awareness about selective mutism. So this is a win-win for me all over, um, is that I get to tell people about this disorder that has just rocked our entire lives, um, that is anxiety-based in its core, which anxiety is a crazy epidemic in our you know, society today, and to make this connection with other families um, who are struggling in this area and just spread awareness. And so um, really, like, so her disorder has given me so much purpose and passion in my own business as well. I love hearing how they, you know, intertwine and how you're able to serve more people yeah. through that capacity. That's so great. Right. Thank so, you. Yeah. So once she was in the hybrid school, you said it lightened your load in a way that you were able to do more with work. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. So um, one, I was not spending all of my day homeschooling her. So she was in a hybrid four days a week. So one, that was a time a load of time, physical time that was off of my plate. And two, just the emotional energy. Her disorder is draining. Anytime you have a child with special needs, it is entirely draining. And so to have her start having success in this area, um, my cup felt full again. That's so great. Great. And so what did you do with the increased time that you had work-wise? Yeah. So, you know, it's just so interesting how things, I, I feel like you can look back and you go, oh my gosh, it was, it was all just in, you know, the, the right timing. So along that time, I started partnering with some community resources to expand my live in-person classes even more. And so I spent November and December just teaching my heart out um, to anybody who wanted to learn cookie decorating and and in the last three months, I have was really just kind of taken aback when I started becoming a resource to other people that were trying to break into that, in the, you know, into my industry, into the cottage baking industry. And knowing that I was just always really surprised people were listening to, to what I was saying and they were appreciative of, of the lessons that I was sharing in the business lessons that I have learned along the way. And so one door just kind of leads to another another and leads to another. And, and, you know, here, here I am um, pursuing all the things in my business, phasing out of cookie production and phasing more into online classes to um, expand my reach and coaching and consulting within my niche creative industry. I love how you've taken your skills from the classroom And, you know, you've taught in local classes at your house and on site at other locations. And now that you're taking it uh, online, there's no walls of your classroom, so to speak. There's no walls to this classroom. And I love that so much. And uh, Ali, so many, I, I think I maybe mentioned earlier that so many of the people who come to my classes are former teachers or they are current teachers. And even within this industry that I'm in, we call ourselves cookiers is what we call ourselves. I come across teachers all the time. And I just think that is so neat because I feel like there's a draw to this creative industry from teachers. That's so great. What what questions do they ask you about going from the classroom to something else or or what advice? What would your two tips for teachers be? Yeah, so I don't know if this comes um you know, immediately and automatically. But I think that after a while, you really get familiar with what your true giftings are. And I found myself in an online space 
coming back to teaching. And although I was not teaching children anymore, I was not teaching, you know, traditional math skills. I'm teaching women how to build a business. And I'm teaching people how to, you know, physically have, you know, these cookie decorating techniques and skills. And I think that it's really important for teachers who are transitioning to stay true to their giftings and to kind of think of that outside of the box that it doesn't mean if you're if your gifting is teaching then it doesn't mean that you have to teach children or you know teenagers um your gifting may be teaching you know adults That's great. yeah and my second tip for teachers is because i f- might not be true but ali i feel like by the time um teachers exit i feel like there's a lot of negativity that they are bringing with them out of the classroom for one reason or another. And I think that it is so important not to burn any bridges on their way out. You have no idea what what resources, you know, through people, through your connections, through people, you have no idea how those will serve you in the future. And I think it's really important to keep it very professional and really friendly on your way out. I think that's such great advice. I think sometimes bridges are burned or relationships become really challenging. Maybe when yes. someone stayed a little too long, a little too long. so, mm-hmm. you know, not wearing out your welcome or, um, right. Yeah. Making right. a transition while you're still in a good place. Uh, anyway. I, yeah. Excellent advice. That- Yeah, I think that's really key, Allie. And I can say that fortunately, I I did, I was able to step out before it really started getting the best of me. You know, I knew within three years that this was a career that I didn't want to go long term in. And, you know, being brave enough to step out and go, you know, I know I went to school for this. I know this is what my degree is in, but this actually might not be what I made today. Thanks for sharing that. Can you also say anything to teachers that are like, well, but this is what my degree's in and this, th- they need me and I chose this. I need to yeah. stay with this. Can you yeah. help that mindset? Yeah, I can. Open? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I mean, I feel the same way. I kept trying to use my degree, you know, with with the homeschool student that um, I tutored straight after, you know, straight out of when I left teaching, and then again using it in ministry um, in a teaching platform, and still going those aren't, those aren't the right fits for me. And then just to keep pursuing and finding that, you know, that just right fit that combines your passion and your purpose together. And I think sometimes you have to try on a lot of hats to get there. And I just want you to tell yourself that that's okay. Like it is okay to have to try on all those hats to find the thing that you're super passionate about. And it might look so random along the way, but looking back on it, (laughs) they're really baby steps to other really amazing things ahead. They really are, Allie. They absolutely are. You're an awesome example of that. We really appreciate you sharing your transition story and what you do now. Can you share anything else that you'd like to share with the audience and let them know how to get in contact with you? Maybe if they want to take some of your classes online or follow you on social media. Yeah, sure. Um, so you could, because I run a business, I am on all the social media platforms, but um, I do give more love to some platforms than others. Um, You can find me on Facebook and on Instagram, but you are really going to see me on Instagram. And of course, I do have a website, nibblecookieco.com. But also, Allie, you know, I think a lot of people, especially teachers um, who are creative, they start something with a hobby, right? And a hobby can be a great transition to a small business. And so that's just something to keep an open mind about for everyone who is tr- transitioning out of teaching and into something that they feel passionate about. So great. I think our hobbies really tell us where some of our passions lay and you're a fantastic example of that. Jill, thank you so much. We will have Jill's contact information, her Instagram handle and all of the links to her resources in our show notes. And yeah, Jill, thank you again for sharing and for your amazing example of going forward with hope to the future. Thanks so much, Allie. I appreciate it.
If you're a teacher in the classroom and you know you need to be doing something different, but you don't know what you're qualified to do, what you can do, how to take those steps, the online course is just for you. It's called Find Your Next Dream Job for Teachers, and it will walk you through a process of identifying what you are a rock star at, what you love and enjoy and are skilled at, and then it will help you see how to connect with real companies and real opportunities aligned with that. We have lists for you of hundreds of companies who love hiring teachers, how to get in contact with them, who you can network through, personally to get in contact with them. And not just that, we have resume templates and cover letter templates already prepared for you, showcasing your educator skills and gearing it towards specific roles and jobs that teachers land effectively. These have all been reviewed by interviewers who interview teachers frequently. They've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. They are going to also coach you on how to interview effectively. So if you're not sure what to do next, go ahead and go to teachertransition.com forward slash find your job and sign up for our course there. We'll also have a link to it in the show notes. This episode may have ended, but connecting doesn't have to. Join us on Facebook or Instagram and get the support and inspiration you need in your personal educator path. If you're loving the podcast, help us spread the word. Leave a review or screenshot the episode, share it on social media, and be sure to tag us at Teacher Transition. Who knows? We may even feature what you share on our social media feed too. Until next time, teacher friends, be sure to click subscribe so you don't miss out on any of the upcoming episodes. Good luck with the great things you're up to right now and keep looking forward to the amazing things to come.